Hello, and welcome to this control systems tutorial number 2.5, in which we will talk about error analysis in systems. In the previous tutorial, we reviewed time response specifications and how to design for them. However, in all of that, we assumed that the steady state response was accurate. And unfortunately, that assumption isn't always accurate. We're going to dive deeper into this critical aspect, error analysis. Just as in our everyday life, where even the tiniest error can lead to major consequences, errors in control systems can greatly impact their performance. So let's explore this concept, what it means, how to measure it, and how to fix the errors we find. So an error in a control system is the deviation that exists when the system appears to have settled down. We call this the steady state error. You can think of it like a door damper. If the door closes perfectly, the error is zero. However, if there's a slight gap that persists over time, that's the steady state error that concerns us. Formally, the steady state error is the final value of a system as time goes to infinity. A system response can only have a final value if it settles down, which implies stability. We'll talk about how to find this stability mathematically in our next tutorials, but for now, let's just discuss it conceptually. So for example, if we look at this example, we can see that it settles at zero, so it's stable. However, if we look at this example, it continually oscillates, so you won't be able to find an error. Neither will you be able to find an error with this example as the output continues to infinity. But if we have a stable system with a final value, we can find the error. Now, if we do have a stable system, the error itself is pretty easy to understand. If we are expecting our end result to be one, and it's something else, the difference between our expected result and the actual result is our error. And you may wonder, how does this happen? My math was perfect, you say. Yes, usually the cause of steady state errors isn't the math, but the modeling of a system. We make assumptions that certain things are linear that in reality really aren't. Inductors, motors, capacitors, they all have real life non-linearities that cause problems with our system. So we need to review two things before we move on. While we won't get into calculating stability right now, we can do a quick introduction to poles and zeros and how these will affect our error analysis. If you remember from the transfer function tutorial, the open loop transfer function in its pole zero form looks something like this. Here, z1 and z2 are the zeros and p1, p2 are the poles. This should make some sense as if s is a negative z term, that will make the entire equation code to zero. And if s equals one of the negative p terms or is zero, it will make the entire equation go to infinity. What we care about here is the number of poles at the origin. If we look at the denominator, we see the s to the n and the power of that s determines the amount of poles at the origin. If it is s to the power zero, meaning the s becomes a one, then there aren't any poles and it is a type zero system. S gives us one pole, so it becomes a type one system, while S squared gives us two poles and is type two. Pretty straightforward. Another quick review that is applicable is that while in the last tutorial, we only assumed a step function input, when we're doing an error analysis, we have to know what the input function is before we can calculate the error. We'll consider the step function, which in the Laplace domain is represented by one over S. We will also discuss the unit ramp function, which is represented by one over s squared. Finally, we'll talk about the unit parabolic input, which is represented by one over s cubed. This is important because both the type of system and the input type will affect the steady state error. Okay, so let's summarize a few points here really quick. First, the steady state error is a way to judge a system's accuracy. Ideally, the system should match the reference input at steady state. And this means that for practical systems, steady state error should be as low as possible. And therefore, one of the measures of the performance of the system. Second, steady state error only makes sense for closed loop systems that have feedback and are stable. Third, that steady state error depends on two main factors, the type of input and the type of the system. Okay. So things are gonna get a little bit more complicated, so I'll try to slow it down and you will need to pay particular attention. Now in the written tutorial, Kushal gives the derivation of where these error equations come from, but to keep this a bit simpler, we'll put the brief derivation up on screen, but then I'll refer you to that written tutorial if you want further detail. The most important thing to glean from this is how the coefficients are dependent on the power of the S in the Laplace of the input. 
I'm gonna say that one more time. The most important thing to glean from this is how the coefficients are dependent on the power of the S in the Laplace of the input. That's very, very important. Okay, moving on. For a unit step input, which is one over S, the steady state error is represented by one over one plus case of P, where case of P is called the position error constant. Note that case of P can be either positive or negative, indicating that the error can be higher or lower than anticipated, which makes a lot of sense. For the unit ramp input, which is one over S squared, the steady state error is represented by one over case of V, where case of V is called the velocity error constant. And the unit parabolic input, which is represented by one over S cubed, is similar with one over case of A. Here, case of A is called the acceleration error constant. To summarize, case of P is the limit as S goes to zero of G sub S. Case of V is the limit as s goes to zero of s times g sub s. In case of a, is the limit as s goes to zero of s squared times g sub s. Now, all of these k coefficients are called the static error coefficients, and their names, position, velocity, and acceleration, should trigger something if you recall your calculus or differential equations. They are called this due to the fact that a step input represents a constant position. A ramp input represents a constant velocity, and a parabolic input represents a constant acceleration. These error constants describe the ability of the system to minimize the steady state error. Now, let's look at how these error constants depend on the type of the system. Let's start with a type 0 system, where the s in the denominator is the first order. As an example, let's consider a simple system modeled as 1 over s plus 1. For case of p, we will take the limit of this original system as s goes to zero. When s goes to zero, we get one over one, so case of p is one in this case. If we multiply g sub s by s, and then we take the limit, we will get s over s plus one, giving us zero over one, which is zero. Case of a, where we multiply g sub s by s squared, gives us s squared over s plus one. When s goes to zero, we end up with zero again. Now, for our errors, we get 1 over 1 plus case of p for position, which gives us 1 over 2, or 1 half. For velocity, it's 1 over case of v, so 1 over 0 gives us infinity. For acceleration, it's 1 over case of a, which is also 1 over 0, giving us infinity again. So, for a type 0 system, position error is constant while velocity and acceleration errors are infinite at steady state. In plain terms, this means that if we have a type zero system and we have a step input, we expect a constant position error. However, if we have a ramp or parabolic input, our error will continue to increase to infinity over time. So that's a type zero system. Let's look at an example type one system now. For a type one system, let's use one over s times s plus one as an example. Doing the same thing as we do with the type 0 system, we end up with case of p as infinity, case of v as 1, and case of a as 0. Now, our position errors are 0, our velocity error is 1, and our acceleration error is infinity. So for a type 1 system, position error is 0 while velocity is constant, and acceleration error is infinite at steady state. Okay, let's discuss the type 2 system and then we'll wrap this all up. If at any point you need to pause the video and look at what's being up on the screen while I'm talking, that is totally fine. All right, for our example, type 2 system, we'll assume that system is 1 over s squared times s plus 1. Running through the different coefficients, we get case of p as infinity, case of v as infinity, and case of a as 1. We take these coefficients and put them into our error calculations, and we get a position error of 0, a velocity error of 0, and an acceleration error of 1. So for a type 2 system, position and velocity errors are 0, while acceleration error is a constant at steady state. If we put this in table form, the pattern is more easily recognizable. Now we can see that when the type of the system is increased for a specific input, the steady state error reduces. This is an incredibly important observation to be made. 
These error constants can be considered part of the specifications during the design of control systems, as these constants themselves convey a surprising amount of information. Let's assume we have k sub v as 100. Since k sub v is defined, this implies a steady state error exists and the system is stable. And k sub v is constant, which just means that the system is of type 1. Next, we can tell that the input being applied is a ramp. Finally, we can tell the error between the input ramp and the output ramp is 1 over k sub v, which means the error is 0 0.01 at steady state. Okay, this was quite the topic. Congratulations on sticking through it, and I hope you learned a lot about error analysis and steady state error in control systems. We not only learned about steady state error, but the steady state error for different standard test inputs, and introduced the static error coefficients. Finally, we used these error constants to obtain steady state error for different types of systems for those standard test inputs. Finally, to get the derivations of all these equations, along with more details and the opportunity to take your time on this topic, please go check out Kushal's write-up that this is based on at circuitbread.com. This officially wraps up our second chapter on control systems, and we're going to get into stability in our third chapter, which is going to be very exciting. I want to take this time to thank our friends of CircuitBread that make these tutorials possible with their support. The best way you can support us is to go check out our friends of CircuitBread and take advantage of their free samples, tools, and educational resources. If you found this video useful, please give it a like, subscribe to our channel, and we will catch you in the next one. Take care. We hope that you enjoyed this tutorial. Did you know that CircuitBread.com has other useful engineering content? In addition to many other features, we have study guides that cover a wide variety of engineering topics at a high level, with equations and diagrams to make it easy to quickly review and reference. Go check them out!